Yeah. 
next Sunday as well. On the fifth Sunday, we take a break. We give all of our youth volunteers a week to catch their breath and to have a true Sabbath and not come. So there's nothing today. But next Sunday, there's Kids Club and Middle School Youth Group from 3.30 to 5. There's youth band practice from 5 to 6.30. And then high school youth group from 6.30 to 8.30 here in this place. Then, on the 9th is our next lunch club. If you're available on the second Thursday of the month, um, where is that clipboard? Here it is. Uh, we have a group of people that come. We eat soup. We eat bread. We have great desserts. It's so much fun. Calories eaten within the church do not count. So it is the perfect time to come and enjoy some yummy food. So I am going to pass this clipboard around today. I'm going to start this way, Kristen. So we're going to go, we're going to start this way, and we're going to come down here, go forward there, come back here, and we should end by Nate and Benjamin. When in doubt, pass the clipboard towards Nate and Benjamin, okay? Um, and then on the 12th, oh, there is also a prayer gathering that night. Mark your calendars for that. We pray for our community, our church, and each other. So if you have prayer requests you'd like us to be praying for that night, let us know. You can put that through on our website, or there's communication cards over there, or there's a link in our weekly e-newsletter e that you can hit for the prayer request as well. Um, but yeah, if there's no school that day, both of those events are canceled. Then, on the 12th, our spring break paperwork is due. So each year, we send a group of people to help with disaster relief or help with construction project in low-income areas. And this year, we're going to Cary, Mississippi. This is really exciting because for two years, we had to cancel because of COVID. And so we are excited to be back with our spring break surf trip. There is paperwork that needs to be filled out if you would like to go on this trip so that we know how many people have planned food for and transportation and lodging. And so this paperwork is underneath the faith development wall on the little table there. If you have questions about it, let me know. Um, but yes, please have that in that morning on the 12th band practice and Bible study. There actually will not be Bible study that day. I forgot, it's the Super Bowl. Even though the Packers won't be in it. All right, <laughs> yeah, who's was cheering? <laughs> and, okay, Lions and Bears aren't gonna be in it either. <laughs> oh, it's not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Men's breakfast is on the 18th, and then I'm excited about Red Arrow EDU. So if you've been part of Red Arrow for some time, you know our adult education program is called Red Arrow EDU. And last fall, Bill and Jan led us through a great time using The Chosen um, and having a discussion about that. This spring, we will be going through our Lent series. So actually, February 22nd is Ash Wednesday. And Red Arrow Ministries doesn't often do much with Ash Wednesday. But because we're kicking off our Lent series that next Sunday, and I'm going to be tying our Bible study in with our sermon series, I encourage you to come that night. And we're going to dig into what is this Ash Wednesday stuff all about. Um, so Red Arrow EDU, it's going to be all of the weeks of Lent. Wednesday, 6.30 to 8.30, I'm leading it, um, and I'm going to pass this clipboard around so that you can let me know if you're in need of child care. Thanks, Kristen. And we had a fantastic time at the First Ladies Brunch yesterday. Huge thank you to the team of people that put that together. Um, and so our next Women's Brunch is going to be on the 25th, so mark your calendars for that. Also on the 25th is the Paw Paw Chili Walk. So this is going to be downtown Paw Paw. Um, there are a lot of great restaurants that are participating with their chilies, and they had a rough time during COVID, and everybody's struggling to bounce back. And so I encourage you. There's flyers about it on the resource table. Um, it's from 1 to 5 that afternoon. Uh, there's, there's fundraisers attached to that that are, are raising funds for Luke's Light, which you know our church loves to support. And so I encourage you to be part of this chili walk. They haven't asked me for volunteers yet, but mark your calendars. They probably will that week. Um, and then what did I miss on the 26th there, Judah? Oh, yeah. Spring break uh, surf trip meeting will be that day. That'll be our final meeting before the trip. So if you're planning on coming to the trip, please be here at 4 o'clock that day. And it will be a youth Bible study Sunday. And also, I'm not going to pass this clipboard around today, but we're going to offer the next round of Turn 1. So Turn 1 of the road course is our membership class here at Renner Ministries. Ben and I team teach this together. And we go through the vision and values of our church and kind of give you a snapshot of who we believe God has called us to be in our community and in the world. And so if you would like to become a member of Red Arrow, we encourage you to sign up. It's going to be the fourth Sunday of February, March, and April. 
And um, yeah, it's just two hours on those three sessions. We have a great time. What else do you need to know about it? I like snacks. You can bring chocolate and peanut butter. That always works too. Talk to me if you have questions. Uh, now it is time for our stewardship moment. Stewardship describes the many ways in which we're called to use our time, our talents, and our treasures that were all given to us by the Lord our God. And so we take time during our worship service to stop and think about how we are doing, giving back with our time, talents, and treasures. And we thank you for all the ways that you support Red Arrow through those three things. If you'd like to give today financially, there are offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary, as well as you can text Red Arrow to 77977, and an online form will come up where you can give a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift. Thank you so much for joining the stewardship journey with us. Thank you. And just in terms of her request, you know, we, uh, as many of you know, Pastor Maria was in Israel for two weeks, and I was a nervous wreck, if you couldn't tell the last few weeks. Um, but again, just as she returned with uh, her former professors from Calvin Seminary, uh, there was a lot of violence in Israel this week. So we need to be praying for the ongoing conflict there. It's really, really hard. And for Maria, it's personal because she's been able to interact with those folks. And so we need to be praying for the violence that we see throughout our world. So let's spend some time before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, it is good to be in your presence. We're thankful for allowing us to get here safely here at the Ministry Center. Lord, we thank you for uh, each and every person that you've called to be here today in person or streaming online. Lord, we just ask that you would draw near to us in a special way. And Lord, we do thank you for the 12 days that uh, Maria was able to spend with the team from Calvin Seminary and just being able to interact and walk in the footsteps where you walk, Lord. What a great opportunity. We can't wait to hear all about it in the coming weeks and months. But, Lord, we do pray for the violence we've seen there in Israel and around that area. Lord, we pray for the violence we've seen in our cities here in the United States as well. Lord, we just ask that you would draw near to those that are hurting in this day, those that perhaps are having health concerns, maybe just emotionally spent. Lord, we just ask that you would, whatever heavy burdens are weighing us down, the weight of the world, whether it's friends or family that are struggling. Lord, please take those heavy burdens off of our shoulders as we lay them before your throne. We know in this past week we have messed up. We've made mistakes. We've done and said things that we ought not to, Lord. And we've hurt you and we've hurt the people around us, Lord. So we're sorry. We ask that you would forgive us now as we confess our sins to you. And Lord, you are mighty to save and mighty to forgive. And as we hear the baptismal run in the background, we're reminded that you Wash us clean. We are wiped clean through what you did on the cross, Lord. And you keep us white as snow. So, Lord, as we finish this reset series today, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to have reset hands that would put into action the things we've talked about the last few weeks. And as we wrestle with a pretty intense passage today in Galatians, may your spirit open up our eyes and ears to receive your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Addison had a prayer request that day. <laughs> now is the time of our service where kids can come forward. Kids of all ages are invited to come up at this time. I know, a future preacher, I think. Good job. Good to see you. All right. Come a little bit closer, up, Shagan clan. Come on up. It's good to have you guys here. We're going to finish our reset series. Remember the last few months we've been talking about resetting our mind and resetting our heart and resetting our voice. And today... We're talking about these things. What are these things right here? What are these things? Yes, Lydia. Our hands. Now, this is an intense passage, and I've been praying all week. Lord, how am I supposed to illustrate such a big concept to our kids? So I think I'm going to be able to pull it off. Okay, so, so hang in there. Stay with me, all right? So let's see that first slide, Judah. So as we reset our hands, we're asking, what effect can God have on our actions? Meaning the things we do day after day. What's going on with that person's hands up on the screen? What's going on? Yeah, Andrew. They're dirty. Maybe he was playing in the dirt. Maybe he's a gardener. We don't know. Maybe his mom and dad said, don't play in the dirt. And then, uh-oh, he got caught because he's got dirt on his hands. But we're really going to wrestle with this idea that the Lord could wipe away our mistakes. And, and wipe our way, what we're going to find out is spiritual death. And this is a hard concept, but you guys got to hang in there, okay? So let's see that next slide. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but being in debt is when you owe something to someone else. Usually it's money, but it could be anything. When an individual gets into too much debt, 
It feels like a heavy weight around your neck. You become a slave to that debt, which prevents you from doing the things you do. So we're talking about spiritual debt today. And so to illustrate that, I've got something in this bag. Josiah, you're pretty strong, right? Can you come and help me out? It's so heavy. Okay? Can you carefully start to pull that thing out for me? Oh, oh, do you see him crunching? Oh, it's so heavy, isn't it? Oh, oh, here, try to, can you pick that up? Oh, I think we need a little bit bigger kid here. I don't want to hurt you. Ryan, can I have you do it? I was going to have uh, our friend Nate do it, but, okay, so let, let's start. I don't want to get sued here, so can you, can you hold that with your... Okay, good. Now, again, like that illustration, it's like the weight around your neck. You doing okay? If it starts getting hard and you start to lose circulation or start to get dizzy, just go ahead and, and carry it like this, okay? So, as we're looking at Ryan struggling to carry the, all of this debt, right now our nation is having a heated debate about whether to raise the debt ceiling, which represents the total amount of money the U.S. government can be in debt. You see that? Debt, right there. So let's check it. There's something called the debt clock. Judah, can we check the debt clock? Oh, boy. We are in debt as a nation, $31 trillion. Kids, if you didn't know, that's a lot of debt. So let's just pretend that I got myself into some debt. And I decided, you know what? I'm tired of carrying all this debt. I want a quick fix. So the Super Bowl's coming up. I heard that. Judah, can we see the next? So I've been Googling how to bet on the Super Bowl because I need to get out of debt. Now, keep in mind, if you like to gamble and you have some extra cash and you know your limits, it's all good. But let's just say I bet on the Super Bowl and I lost big time. And now I've got this heavy debt. So it is heavy, right? Ooh, you're starting to get bruised back here. I'm going to move this a little bit. Okay? And so I'm completely in debt, and I'm way down. But suddenly, someone came along and took that debt off of my neck and got rid of it. Now, how do you feel, Ryan? I feel pretty good. He feels pretty good. But kids, what would you say to me after getting into all that debt, after having someone take it away, if, if I said, you know what? I think that was a fluke. I think I need to do a little bit more betting. Judah, can we see him? And so I wanted to um, download the Bet MGM Sportsbook. And as soon as I downloaded it, I would be in debt $31 trillion. What would you say to me if somebody wiped away the debt and now I'm able to put it all back on if I just download it? What would you do with my smartphone, Emma? Would you take it away from me? Absolutely. Would you say, Pastor Ben, don't go back into debt, right? Because what we're going to find out today is all the debt that humanity carries was taken off through what Jesus did on the cross. And so the Apostle Paul is saying to his church, why would you get into debt again? Christ has wiped away the debt. He's taken that heavy debt. So why would you put that around your neck once more? And what we're going to find is just like if Ryan, can you imagine, can I put it on you one more time? Can you imagine Ryan at school tomorrow? And his teacher's like, Ryan, can you undo your assignment? He's like, well, he's walking around. He can't do it, right? Because when we have this overwhelming spiritual debt, we can't use our hands to serve the Lord. All we can do is carry around that debt each and every day. So good job listening. Thanks for tracking with me. Ryan, let me help you out on that. I don't want you to get hurt. Here, uh, here can you hold that bowl for me? Okay. You okay? Let's give Ryan a round of applause. Go. If you attend preschool in first grade, you can head to rest out with your parents' permission. Everyone else, if you could open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to be in chapter 5. For the last few weeks, we've been wrestling through this reset series. Oftentimes, in January, we do these things called New Year's resolutions. But oftentimes, we only do them for a few weeks, and then life catches up with us. Maybe we were supposed to eat better, and then a new restaurant opens. Maybe we're supposed to do some exercise and you look outside and say, ah, it's kind of snowy outside. I don't think it was a good job in there. But what we found out is with the Lord's help, we can reset different aspects of our life. And as I tried to illustrate the kids, today we're focusing on the need for God to reset our hands. And so, Judah, if we could see that next slide. Once we are reset by God, we get to join Him in His work. 
which always involves freeing those in bondage, embracing those in isolation, and loving even the unlovely in our midst. It's mind-blowing reality, if you think about it, this noble ability to live beyond oneself, to actually consider another's needs ahead of our own, who does something like that? Not just once, mind you, but time and time again as a way of life. Those who have been reset by God, that's who. That's who lives like that. And so for the last few weeks, we've been in the Old Testament. And just as a, as a point of context here, we're now fast forwarding to where Jesus has come. He's lived the perfect life. He's died on the cross to wipe out our spiritual debt. He's risen from the grave. And now Paul has gone around the world to start all these churches, but he hears some terrible news. That the churches are starting to go back and get into more spiritual debt. And you can imagine how upset the Apostle Paul is. Jude, if we could see the next slide, please. It's important to know that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the very last thing he said was this. We see in the text in John, to tell No, I can never pronounce it. To tell us that. Which means it is finished. If you were in debt in the ancient world and you paid off your debt, you would get a little receipt and that word would be scribbled on it. And that word meant that your debt was paid in full. And when Jesus said it, as the very last thing he did before he breathed his last breath, was saying all of our spiritual debt, all the mistakes we've ever done or we're going to do, was all paid in full. And so Paul starts this passage really upset. Why? Judah, can we see the next slide? Because the church were putting their heads back into what he calls the yoke of slavery. As Ryan demonstrated, that is a heavy burden. To have your death wiped away only to stick your head back into that yoke of slavery. And so Paul's upset because on one hand, some people were trying to perfectly live out the law. There's no way, if you know your Old Testament, that God's people ever perfectly lived up to God's standards. And yet now that Christ has wiped away their debt, they're, they're sticking their head in this yoke being indebted again. Or on the other side of the yoke of slavery, some of them were using the freedom that God gave them to do whatever they want. They said, God already wiped away my debts, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Kind of like a person who is in deep debt, gets that debt canceled, and then goes and starts gambling. And so you can imagine Paul's frustration, his anger, when he realizes that this is not the freedom that Christ has given us and that they need to have reset hands. And so keep all this in mind as we watch the intro video and read the passage. Judah, can you roll that video, please? and sisters were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. thing about being reset by Jesus is that it actually begins to impact what we do. We all spend our time doing something. So what if we devote the action of our lives to God? You see, Jesus wants to reset your hands. Let's take a look at it. Galatians 5, starting with verse 1. Paul writes, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. 
For in Christ, there is neither circumcision or uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut on in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you, for a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one that may be, or rather the one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. For you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. For if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. And so the Apostle Paul has been working through this letter, trying to help them see that God has done some amazing things for them. And they were basically backsliding. They were going back into their old way of living, and they were getting more and more into this spiritual death. And he says, look, you have been given this great freedom in Christ. What are you doing with that freedom? And so as I was working through this passage, being a former history teacher, I was reminded of a great quote from John Adams. He said, posterity, guess who that is? You and me and all of our children. You will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. And he says, I hope you will make good use of it. Paul hears that the Galatians are not making good use of the freedom that God gave them. In fact, they were going back to put themselves into the spiritual death. Thank you, Judah. Specifically, he points out, he says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by this yoke of slavery. And again, what he's referring to is that idea of spiritual death. And again, the chains are actually probably hang heavier than the, than the death itself. But imagine going through your days walking around like this. It would be miserable. You would hurt your back. He says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you if you let yourself be circumcised. Now, what is he talking about there? We know from the Old Testament that God's people were supposed to be set apart. And they were given the sign, the religious rite of circumcision, to demonstrate that they've been cut out of the world and set apart. But now that Christ has come, that religious rite has been done away with and replaced with baptism. And he's saying that there's this false teacher, there's this corruption that is coming to the church saying, you know what, I know you think that Jesus paid it all on the cross, uh -uh. you also have to become Jewish, you also have to become all of these things. And so some of the people, while Paul was gone, were falling into that trap. And they were going through all of these religious rites that were finished and completed by Christ's perfect sacrifice. And so you can hear how frustrated he gets Verse 3, again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised is obligated to obey the whole law. Now, as I look around the room, we got some really good people here today. I don't think any, well, let me double check, maybe Barry Brook ties it, but uh, none of us are perfect, right? None of us, myself included. And what Paul is saying is that if you go down that road that the Old Testament folks had to go, you have to obey every single law. I forget the total number, but there was hundreds of different laws that they all had. And Paul said, why would you do that? Why would you go back? Why would you put all that spiritual debt back on your neck? You were trying to be justified by the law. You're trying to earn your salvation. You've been alienated by Christ. You've fallen away from grace. And then he points something out. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness and we hope. Remember, Paul anticipated Jesus was going to come back any day. Sometimes when we have our kite day, our ascension service, we'll just stop and be like, Lord, are you coming back today? Because remember, when he got taken up into heaven, the disciples were like, that was awesome. And the angels come up behind and say, what are you guys waiting around for? you got a job to do. That's what Paul is saying. While we wait for Christ to return, we have a job to do. So imagine if Christ paid the ultimate penalty to take away all of this debt, and he comes back and he finds out that we once again have this spiritual debt around the neck. How's he going to feel? He's going to be upset as Paul was. And so he's pointing out to them, why would you do that? 
we see, for in Christ there's neither this circumcision, uncircumcision, of any value. It's all worthless now. Why? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Let's look at the Greek there. Judah, if we can see it. It literally says faith working through love. We see that the faith stands in contrast to works. Why? Because it entails directing our dependence away from our actions, right? Sometimes Christians try to earn their salvation, but instead to rest in the completed work in Christ. Yet genuine faith in Christ does not leave our affections, our motives, our consequent actions unchanged. The one who believes in Jesus Christ will demonstrate the reality of their belief. How? Through a reset life. That's what Paul's pointing out. And then he uses this analogy. He uses one of his favorites. I, I'm the... I really like metaphors. I really like analogies, right? I'm a teacher, right? I was going into a pretty heated discussion, and Maria Seppi says, don't use any cute analogies. I don't want to hear any metaphors, just the facts. Paul, he loves using metaphors. In this one, Judah, can we see it? I have personal experience with it. With my great coach, Sheila Miller, me and the team from Team World Vision were able to complete a half marathon in October. One of the most rewarding but miserable experiences of my life. <laughs> At around the 10 mile mark, again, I'm 46 years old. The, the, I don't know, again, if we have a nurse or doctor in here, the little cushion between your two leg bones that meet as a knee, it was like God poked a hole in both of them. It was like, <sighs> so it was bone on bone, and I'm running. And I'm trying to finish, and I've already told you, there was an 80-year-old lady that passed me up, and that was really embarrassing. <laughs> Come on, youngster, you can do it. I'm like, oh, man. But soon after she passed me up, some other people just like, whoosh, whoosh. And again, it was super cold in the morning, so people were throwing off their hats. They're throwing off their scarves. They're just, as they're running, they're throwing off sweatshirts. And it's almost like a minefield. And so I'm running, my knees are hurting, and I'm like dodging all of these things. I graciously put it on a tree branch when I run. I didn't want anybody to trip. And this is the image that Paul gives. That faith is a race. Right here, Red Arrow, we join the journey on the road with Jesus. And we go on this journey. Paul's saying, who cut into you on this race? Who is trying to trip you up? Who is throwing stumbling blocks in front of you? And then he takes a side and he says, look, I know it's not everybody. But that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And he uses the proverb, just a little yeast through the whole batch. It gets ruined. And he says, I'm confident the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, and they're not named, will pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching this idea, why am I still being persecuted? Remember, Paul was not a popular guy. The Jewish leaders hated him because he was saying that Jesus was the Messiah. Right Today, the Jewish folks are still waiting for their Messiah. So they didn't like Paul, and they persecuted him. The Roman authorities didn't like him because he was upsetting the cultural apple cart because he was starting what they felt was a new religion when all it was was the fulfillment of the one true faith. And so Paul's saying, look, if I'm really doing this, why am I still getting picked up? Why am I getting thrown in prison? No. In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished, and we have to dig into this a little bit more. Judah, can we see it? Can we unpack that? Remember, the cross's offense was and is its demonstration that no other remedy, right? No, nothing that sinful people could ever contribute could ever wipe away our debts, right? We think of Ryan again. Man, are my neck's going to hurt by the second service. Whew. Again, nothing that we can do can ever get this debt off of our necks and reconcile us to God. The cross itself destroys all human pride and self-reliance. And then in a very graphic point, as far as those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and, yes, castrate themselves. But then he points out the main idea for this morning. You, my brothers and sisters, let's look at the message. Judah, I think it's the next one there. I love this paraphrase. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. Leave that up there, Judah, and destroy your freedom. Think about that for a minute. In our membership class, we talk about being a stewardship of not just our time, talents, and resources, but our free time. What do you do it in your free time? Do you just binge watch YouTube? 
Do you serve other people? Do you just kind of hide? Paul's asking this question, if Christ has given you freedom, what are you doing with that freedom? Are you using your hands to make the world a better place? Thank you, Judah. And so there's this idea. For the entire law is filled with keeping this one command. Again, now he's quoting Jesus. Remember, they said, Rabbi, what is the most important law in all of the Old Testament? And again, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength. And then here is love your neighbor as yourself. But the big question is, who's your neighbor? I just heard on the news this morning that more and more, possibly to the greatest time in our history, we don't know our neighbors. We don't know our next door neighbor. We don't have a relationship. We don't know who's in the next apartment or the house next door. And so for this question, who is our neighbor, we go back to my friends at Sesame Street. <laughs> oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet when you're walking down the street. They're the people that you meet each day. Oh, the Red Air Choir comes out. I can't continue. Again, I remember as a little kid, I'm like, I don't like my neighbor. Elmo said, I don't care. I have to be nice to him. I have to treat him with care. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what Jesus said. And that's what God has always intended, that we use this freedom to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then with one warning, if you bite and devour each other, watch out. You'll be destroyed by each other. And you think Christians should know better. But how many churches have we been part of where people just bite at each other? So think back to the children's illustration. And as I said, I, I kind of warn everybody, this is a heavy, heavy thing. Ryan, can you help me out again? My neck's starting to hurt. Okay, come here. He's young. He can bounce back faster than I can. Now again, no light thing, right? That is a heavy, heavy thing. Good. I think that's wise. Okay. I love the muck boots. Benjamin, did you see that? He's, 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 he's doing the Benjamin there. That's awesome. Okay, so hold that, hold that tab. Okay. When we see that God could reset our hands, if your debts had been wiped clean completely at great cost to God, how should that reality change our actions every day and how we relate to those around us? If we literally had to carry this around, poor Ryan, his education is going to be stifled. He's not going to be able to run around on the playground or play sports, right? Can you imagine one day walking down the aisle with this debt, right, leaning him over like this? It would be miserable. And so this is the question. As that debt has been wiped clean and we get that off of our neck, what should we do with the freedom that God has given? Good job. If you look at the next slide, please. As we tried to point out that Paul is saying, why would you stick your head back into that debt? Trying to perfectly live out the law, which means we're trying to earn our salvation. But the other side is just as bad, our fallen human nature. Doing whatever we want. Why? Because God's just going to forgive us anyway. No, by no means, he says. And so, as we looked at today, should be one more slide there. The debt clock. When I was reading the text, I'm like, man, how do I illustrate a debt that can never be paid back? Hmm. <laughs> Let's go to the world debt clock. If you've never been to that website... It's fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. I said to myself, Lord, what can we do as a nation? Because again, there's a debate right now. What can we do? I wish that somehow, some way, we could go back in time. Go to the next slide, please. 1980, right? We all remember, oh, no, you went too far there. Do you go back one? 1980, right? How many of you remember 1980? It was awesome. My Hot Wheels were so cool. <laughs> and my big wheel, too. But here's the thing. In, back in 1980, we had $859 billion in debt. That was manageable. But now in 2023, it's $33 trillion. So if we don't change something, again, thinking of the debt we cannot pay ourselves, in 2027, we go forward $44 trillion. That's a lot of debt for us to carry around. But what's more scary about this concept is you look closely on the unfunded liabilities, Judah, can we see it? And if we add everything up in 2027, we will owe as a nation $118 trillion. There is no magic wand to get rid of that amount of debt. And so when I thought of that number, I said, that's it, Lord. We had that much spiritual debt up against us. And there's no way that anyone can ever repay that debt. And yet Christ did. 
He went to the cross and he paid it all for you and for me. So why in the world would we use that freedom to go back into spiritual debt, trying to earn our salvation or doing whatever we want where it's going to harm ourselves and others? I forget, is there another slide here? Should we come on? Wouldn't it be great if we had a reset button? We actually do. So we end where we began. This was the first week illustration reset button. You can watch it on YouTube if you feel a bit lost. But here's the thing. Let's, I think it'll pick up there, Mark. So we're going to hit the reset button. Oh, it didn't work. Mm. Anybody ever hear the Lord's Prayer? Have you ever been uncomfortable with that statement? Notice it's conditional. God, forgive us our debts <gasps> as we forgive our debtors. Oh. Jesus can reset any spiritual debt we still carry around our necks. And with the freedom from that debt, we are called to allow God to reset our hands as we serve one another humbly in love and love our neighbors as ourselves. This is what I want everybody to do. I want everybody to put out your hands like this. Okay. And in a moment, I'm going to start praying. When I start praying, I want you to move your hands to this, demonstrating that you want God to reset your hands today. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for resetting our hands. Lord, we can't do it on our own any more than we can wipe away that amount of debt that our nation owes. Lord, we don't want to have that heavy yoke of slavery weighing us down around our neck, preventing us from using these hands to serve you. But Lord, for some of us, they're dirty. We've been doing things we ought not to. And because we know that you paid it all on the cross, Lord, we want to hear in our hearts and our minds that it is paid in full. And so, Lord, use these hands to serve our neighbors, and that's anyone we meet, Lord, and point them to you. So, Lord, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for resetting our lives, and thank you for resetting our hands today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a song that kind of details that spiritual debt being taken off of our shoulders and put on Christ. And so we just ask you to remain seated for a time and reflect on God's word for us today. Ready? Okay, one, one, two, three, So
Yeah, but that's... 